previously on the Administrative Results channel. Size! I found a grenade. Ah, hey, who shit my foxhole? Private Ryan, reporting for duty, sir. Uh, you want to take a seat, son. I have, um, well, there's no easy way to say it. Um, your brother, well, uh, your brothers, they've all been um, killed in action. Gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. I'm your host, The Talking Balaclava. Today we're going over a gun near and dear to all Americans' hearts, the M1 Grand. Before you do that, here's my impersonation of Travis Haley if he was in World War II back in time. All right, here we go. All right, hey, so breaking it down, all right, hey, if we're looking at the biomechanics of our M1 Grand, okay, hey, guess what you have? You have eight rounds of 30 6 to use against those bad guys. All right. Now, fundamentally in biomechanics, all right, how do they come into play uh, platform? Looking at, at ergonomics of this weapon are a lot better. You may not be fighting with your own weapon. Brian, so... Brian, where's your BAR? Bottom of the channel, sir. Big time to drown me. Find a replacement. Come on, let's go. Now, this gun. Um, of course, is plenty of content covering this particular gun. Now, diving into the gear. So, contact, not a World War II historian, very limited knowledge on World War II gear, technology, kit. Of course, I'm a big appreciator of World War II stuff, but when it gets down to talking about, like, say, certain kit, it's not like, oh, I know what that helmet's uh, designator is. I know, I know it's like, yes, I can identify what helmet that belongs to or what nationality that helmet belongs to, but I don't know the specific, like, this is a M493 helmet, so I, I, I do apologize, but I got a helmet right here, GI helmet. It really helps with the LARP look. We got some kind of bandolier now. It is for a 30 6 Now, this one has a marker on it. It says TW41942. Pop him! Pop him ammo, God damn it! The 30 cal! So, I don't know for my World War II guys if this is authentic or not. I know some of you World War II guys out there are pretty dialed in when it comes to World War II kit. Now, yet again, I apologize if my kit looks very farby. It's just, it's, it's, part, of the, it's part of the channel. And of course, we got my dummy grenade. Rick, where'd you get that grenade from? I found it. For all the uh, big LARP action. All right. Now, with the kit out of the way, let's quickly look over the gun. Now, what this is, is M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S-E. -E. I, I think of my disclaimers out of the way of what I am to you. Now, I am no expert. I am no historian. I am not an in-depth guy of mechanics of weaponry. I am a appreciator of the fine craftsmanship. I enjoy how the gun functions. I like the human connection that firearms have to us. And I really like being able to show that off to the audience. So without further ado, let's look at the M1 Grand. Now, 
before. I can hear the clicking happen if they haven't hit the uh, comment section already. I know it's often like, yes, made by the, the, that Canuck up north, uh, John Gurin, Garin, Garand, Garin, I don't know. How do you say his name? Garand? Garin. Garin. All right, yeah. All right, so you have John Garand, right? And I know that's how you say his name. The problem is, and I like what, um, what's his face, AK Daddy, uh, Brandon Herrera said, is he said how the enunciation of it in the English language to us is Garand. And I think that sounds better. I think it sounds cooler. Garand just sounds like, just sounds like Gary, and Gary sounds weak. Any Garys out there, I'm sorry, but you are allowed to legally change your name. Running the gun requires a sacrifice. Now, the specifics of this rifle, there are a bunch of these made, and they've been used, and they had a good service history, you know, from that 40s to 50s era, right? And these were a great battle implementation during World War II. If I was a soldier during World War II, this would probably be my number two pick if I was an American soldier during World War II, and I could get any weapon I want. And of course, I'd probably end up with this. It'd probably be, well, I mean, theoretically, this is a hard one, because we always think about, like, if I got sent back in time, what gun do I want to use with the gun stuff and the gun knowledge I know now? Which one of you shit in my foxhole? Um, you know, I often think of the M1 carbine or, the, you know, the carbine series. Um, that the Americans issued out. That's probably the most like modern-ish setup that they had, but to me it's tough, right? So like that to me is I'd go with probably that one, and then probably second would be an M1 Grand. But then I also think about some of the BAR style weapons they had, like the Colt Monitor. I think that one would be pretty sick. Um, you know, it's like I, I I I know Americans were probably a little bit less health orientated back then, but they're probably healthier. But they weren't like about getting like jacked and, and buff. Like, I, I don't think I'm jacked or buff. I think I work out a healthy amount, so I think running a BAR like that. I'm out, I'm out, is anybody really bandolier? It would suck, but once you start shooting it, it would be legit. Now, outside of that, eight rounds of 30-06, this literally sends them at like a railgun pace, man. When you're shooting this, and you can see the dirt just flying up compared to when you're shooting like, it's like the weird things you notice, like shooting a 5.56 five, at dirt and then watching how, you know, the, the velocity of the round, you know, affects the terrain around it. But with a 30-06, it's like chunking out the earth, man. It's really cool. It's really cool to watch. It's really fun to shoot. Um, people often think, they'll ask like, oh, I always wanted to shoot M1 Grand, you know, when I'm talking to them. I'm like, they're like, how's the recoil? I'm like, surprisingly, it's really not that bad. The semi-automatic, how, how it's set up with the recoil system and everything, it, it, yes, it recoils, yes, you feel it, of course, but it's really not that bad. Like, it's a really enjoyable gun to shoot. And to me, I have to think about how crazy, you know, we filmed the Car 98 video, and it took a while to burn through that ammo. Like, I was trying to shoot as fast as I could with that bolt gun. <laughs> It took me, I had to really pace myself with the M1 Grand trying to shoot, so we didn't shoot all our ammo for all the different shots we wanted to do. And like that, you gotta think about that on a battle implementation level. All right, so you have this army, the German army during World War II. A lot of those guys are running bolt guns. Yes, they have some sick technology and gear, you know, tanks, they're rolling out, you know, the SUG-44, they got the MG-42, infamous of being Hitler's buzzsaw, huge, or very high stickler rate of fire. But you gotta think when it comes down to it, the amount of volume you can put out, that's only one MG42. Now that's only two MG42s. You know what I mean? It's like, but if you have an entire platoon of guys and they all have M1 Garands and they're all just dumping 30 hot six at you, that's pretty freaky. Now I can imagine how crazy it'd be if there's a whole bunch of MG42 shooting back at you, you know, but even still, with that bolt gun, the mass of fire you're putting out, and keep in mind, I'm no military guy, so I can only imagine, I can only um, you know, play the simulation in my head and try and think like, okay, I was out here shooting M1 Grand. I could dump eight rounds in like, I don't know, a second-ish. You can really, you can really push it if you're just spraying and praying. But with that bolt gun, that's going to take me like, I don't know, probably a second around to dump that, you know, or if I'm really cooking. Now, as far as putting accurate shots on target, kind of like how I'm digesting and breaking apart this video is, more so the human connection I have to this particular rifle. If you are someone like me who enjoys firearms, you enjoy history, um, those two things mash up very well together. And I think, you know, watching the iconic pop culture references of World War II, uh, you know, being from movies, TV series, video games, and you're just constantly bombarded with this great uh, content to consume. You know, Saving Private Ryan, iconic, iconic 
movie, you know, showcasing all the World War II technology, the attention to detail. You know, historically speaking, how accurate is that story? It's not. It's, it's about, but it's about, you know, Steven Spielberg, how well he portrayed the history, you know, how well he showed off the violence, the kinetic action of it, really stuck to a lot of people. You know, there was those firsthand accounts of, you know, old World War II soldiers having to leave the scene or leave the, leave the theater during the beach landing scene just because due to the, the ferocity of it. Can you imagine that? You know what I mean? There's those memories coming back to you and hitting you like that from a movie and portrayal of media that's so accurate. And I am happy that it exists because it does show off, you know, what those guys went through. And that is something that's very connected to our American history. And my grandpa, you know, rest his soul, he's, 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 he's passed away now. But he served in World War II. You know, I don't think he was a knuckle dragger. I think he was one of the Navy boys. But still, with that being said, the amount of conflict one could have seen, you know, it's it's pretty high. And the loss of life was drastic. And one of those things separating a lot of those GIs, a lot of those guys fighting was their M1 Garand. And sometimes your ticket's going to get punched, but at least you have, you know, a good option to fight against, say, you know, some German kid that has a car 98. So when you really think about, to me personally, like, what would have I been? What, what would have happened if I would have gone back in time or, or if I was in the shoes of a young American going off to fight in this great conflict of the nation asking of me to be a part of this, this huge meat grinder that's taking place in some parts of the world? And what you truly have with you is an M1 Garand between you and the God Almighty. You know, typical gun reviews, ergonomics, stuff like that. It's a World War II gun. It's a battle rifle, true in the truest sense. You know, if this thing was around during World War I, can you imagine the souls of the Germans who would have wrecked back then? Like, even, it did really good in World War II when you're fighting all these Axis powers that literally their main guys have bolt guns. That, to me, is wild. Just running the bolt gun in the last episode was a pain in my ass. I couldn't imagine that being like, all right, cool. Hey, it's 1940-ish, 1939-ish. Uh, uh, we're gonna go invade Poland. We're gonna go invade China. Uh, you're a Japanese soldier, you're a German soldier, and they just gave you a bolt gun. Like, you probably not may know any better, but it's like, oh my God, I would be like, that's a death sentence to me, trying to work a bolt gun in a firefight <laughs> up close with other people. Sure, the bad guys may have a bolt gun, but it's like, oh, there's still machine guns, there's still sub guns that exist that could wreck your world. It's just so crazy to me. It really is nuts. It really is that, you know, that, that, was, only, that was within, like, your grandparents' lifetime. You know, some of them, a lot of those World War II vets are passing away now, but that was within my lifetime having a grandparent that served in World War II. That was in, probably within some of your and most of yours' lifetimes. You know what I mean? Some of my older audiences, some of you old guys out there that watch this, your parents may have fought in World War II. You know, it's, I don't, it's, it's tough because, yet again, I'm no big expert on this. To me, it's, it's the significance and the pop culture icon that it is. You know, I think of Band of Brothers, Dick Winters, the leadership and the professionalism and his heroism that showed from him and his men, you know, going all throughout Europe from D-Day to, you know, the liberation of the, uh, or from D-Day to, you know, Bastogne and all of that. So it really is cool and it really is an honor almost to have this gun appear on the channel. And it has like one of the best sounds in the world. So I know this interests most guys of how things feel in the hands. So we'll talk about the, like how this weapon particularly feels when you're running a gun in it in case you never held on to an M1 Garand. If you haven't, I encourage you to go out, check it out. It's part of American history. Uh, it's your homework from Admin Results. Um, M1 Garand 101, basic economics, I don't know. So in the hands, the gun is rather beefy compared to say, the Car 98. The Car 98 of course feels much more streamlined. Uh, that is because there's no gas system involved. Yet again, AK Daddy had a good video on the M1 Grand talking about its relation to the AK-47. That was rather interesting, and I enjoyed that. So, of course, we'll link that. You can go watch him uh, talk about that. It feels rather good, a little bit girthy. If I was getting shot at by an MG-42 and a whole bunch of Jerry's with Car 98s, or, you know, a whole bunch of Japs with Nambu rifles or whatever they had, and type, what is it, the the Arasakas, you know, I would I would feel a lot really good holding on to this gun knowing I have eight rounds of 30-06 ready to give back to them. So it feels good in the hands is all I'll say. There's like this sick, nice little curve to it. It's like got a nice little curve, like a good woman, you know what I mean? Nice and curvy in the right spots. It's, it doesn't leave you wanting, so it, it does a good job. You know, I think that just about covers everything I wanted to talk about on the M1 Grand. You know, yet again, I'm no history buff. I'm no expert. I always encourage you to take my word with a grain of salt and do your own research and study on this, do your own training, whatever you want to do, right? Because, yet again, I'm a dude on the internet, on YouTube, wearing a ball of and I'm telling you about stuff. So, that's why we encourage this. If you want to support the channel in any way, shape, or form, gentlemen, 
Patreon is a great way to support the channel. I release videos to my Patreon subscribers first, for the most time. We also do giveaways there on the Patreon. Merchandise, an excellent way to support the channel. Merchandise helps out, take care of all my costs for the channel. So, appreciate you. As always, stay easy, stay breezy. I'll catch you boys on the flip.